I'm uh, Greg Glores, and I work with the Mayo Clinic. We're looking at uh, the field of um, liver cell cancer um, and all the contributions that have occurred uh, in the past and where it's going in the future. Liver cell cancer is really a, an extremely important field. So it's there, you have to think locally and, 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 real, and act globally. So globally, there are 600,000 cases of liver cell cancer uh, a year in the world. Um, even in Western societies, it's the number one um, uh, lethal complication of people who have chronic liver disease with scarring of the liver or cirrhosis. Uh, and so there's been a lot of attention focused on what we can do to treat early liver cancer, uh, prevent liver cancer, um, extend people's lives who have liver cancer. So it has basically become almost a, a subdiscipline of itself within the field of liver diseases. Liver cancer is uh, unique amongst human cancers in that we basically know who's at risk for getting the disease. It's people who have chronic viral liver diseases uh, with scarring of the liver or uh, cirrhosis. Um, uh, cirrhosis of any other cause can result in, in liver cancer, uh, such as alcohol, um, fatty liver disease. Uh, but, the, but the vast majority of people with liver cancer uh, globally have viral hepatitis. Um, it used to be that people would simply show up, be sick, uh, would start having complications of their liver disease, such as, such as ascites or jaundice, and imaging studies would show uh, that they had uh, advanced liver cell cancer, and it was often written in textbooks uh, that the life expectancy was weeks to months. Um, with that, uh, the, the field attempted to move back earlier in the, in, in the disease progression to see if we could identify uh, earlier uh, cancers which could be treated. And this led to the concept of screening people with advanced liver disease. And so uh, Dr. Bruch and his colleagues have really been pioneers um, in helping us identify uh, early cancer in cirrhosis. So um, how should we screen? Um, what modalities should we screen with? When we find a nodule uh, in the liver, uh, what's the, what are the radiographic characteristics of a liver cell cancer versus just a cirrhotic nodule? Um, if you're uncertain, what's the recall process? Uh, and so there's been a huge emphasis with modern imaging uh, modalities on identification of the very earliest stages of this disease. And there's been tremendous progress in that way, and we, and we have now uh, have guidelines. So, for example, the European Association for the Study of Liver Diseases has guidelines for the early diagnosis of liver cell cancer. Um, and so we now know that we should be screening patients uh, with ultrasound every six months, that we see a nodule. Uh, we have an algorithm for which imaging studies to use next to make the diagnosis, such as CT or MRI. We now know what the characteristics are. On, on those imaging modalities where one can make a diagnosis of a very small cancer. Uh, the, the, the trick is if something small, it's almost impossible to biopsy or to get an accurate biopsy. And I think we have probably led the field in human cancer by establishing criteria for the non-invasive diagnosis of cancer uh, in a cirrhotic liver. Also along with that became, uh, came the development of therapies for early liver cell cancer. So we have techniques now where um, physicians uh, and interventional radiologists or surgeons um, can inject uh, probes into very small lesions and uh, use radiofrequency uh, technology to ablate the lesion, uh, destroy the lesion um, without surgery. We have uh, surgery has become much more refined. We now know um, in a sick liver uh, who's a potential candidate for surgery uh, without hurting the patient, um, who will benefit from surgery. Uh, we've had the advent of liver cell, uh, of liver transplantation for liver cell cancer um, for patients with, with limited disease whose livers are too sick to undergo surgery or perhaps ablation. Um, in intermediate stages, we've learned about local regional therapies 
where you can stop the blood flow to the tumor um, with a matrix device or beads. Uh, we can coat the beads with chemotherapeutic agents, so we can not only get a hypoxic or ischemic insult to the tumor, but we can also deliver drugs locally. And we've, and we've shown uh, over this period of time that that also can be effective in prolonging patients' lives. Um, so there's been a tremendous advance in the diagnosis and treatment of early stage disease. And um, this supplement will address many of those uh, advances uh, with, with uh, Dr. Bruch uh, having been a pioneer um, in this area, and he will be able to articulate quite clearly um, how, how the field matured, how we came upon these guidelines, how the, how the guidelines can be followed, uh, where, where they might be variances from the guidelines that we need to be aware of, what are the caveats uh, for that process. Um, we're very fortunate in this supplement to have uh, Dr. Mazzaferro as a, as a surgeon um, who, who defined the criteria for liver transplantation for uh, small liver cell cancer, um, and his uh, insights uh, have really stood the test of time, have been adapted by many uh, countries um, uh, to prioritize organs for people with cirrhosis and liver cell cancer. And he will address the, the ongoing debate about if you have a small cancer and you're potentially amenable uh, to surgery, what's the, what's the best therapy? Is it uh, radiofrequency ablation that we talked about? Is it surgery? Is it liver transplantation? How can we take a, a vast menu now of uh, very uh, successful options and apply them uh, in a meaningful uh, way to the right patient. Um, along with this, we've entered the modern era of genetics, and there's been a large number of studies trying to unravel the genetics of liver cell cancer. So we have, um, as the new technologies have, have matured, we, we, these have been consistently applied to liver cell cancer. So we've looked at uh, uh, transcriptome profiling, next generation sequencing, um, exome sequencing. Uh, we've been able to look at epigenetic changes. Uh, we've looked at, uh, as a field, um, uh, microRNA biology, uh, um, non-coding RNAs, a copy number variation uh, in a large, uh, comprehensive way by investigators worldwide. Uh, I think what we've learned from uh, those techniques is that there are subclasses of liver cell cancer, and they behave differently. Uh, we're beginning to understand how we can stratify patients for various therapies. And uh, these, these advances, I think, in the future will become very important so we can um, determine which patients will benefit from transplant versus resection, what's the risk of recurrence if you have a resection based on your genetic profile, um, or if you have an adverse genetic profile, perhaps transplant's the right option. So we're beginning to use um, refined genetic information to help make uh, a, a patient decisions. Um, I think uh, we have a drug now for people who have advanced cancer, who have progressed through the various stages or who, who present very late. Um, uh, uh, two seminal studies uh, have been published in the last 10 years demonstrating that the drug serafinib prolongs life. This has reawakened interest in, in the therapies for liver cell cancer, and so a multitude of uh, clinical studies have been performed. Um, uh, trying to identify uh, targets uh, that are druggable, and then look at those in sophisticated international trials for the treatment of, of this disease. Uh, it's been a bit uh, disappointing in, in, in that we've had the one drug, serafinib, which, which clearly shows a survival benefit in multiple studies. We've now come up with a second drug to date. And, Perhaps we just need to be able to better stratify patients based on their uh, genetic information um, so we can get the right drug to the right patient with the right genetic profile. Um, finally, we're beginning to understand that 
there are two types of liver cell cancer, hepatocellular, that's 97%, 98% of all liver cell cancers, but there's a second type, clangiocarcinoma, that's increasingly becoming important. Um, and people are recognizing uh, clangiocarcinoma um, in patients with cirrhosis, even viral hepatitis, uh, which is a much worse disease and probably requires um, a more uh, different uh, approach uh, clinically and therapeutically. And we're starting to understand um, what those tumors look like in cirrhosis, when to think about clangiocarcinoma, how to make the diagnosis of clangiocarcinoma, and, and begin um, a different treatment strategy for those cancers. So, so I would say that over uh, the last uh, several decades, we've had tremendous advances, um, but we still have a long ways to go to eradicate and, and potentially cure patients. I think that uh, we will c need to continue to work on early diagnosis um, uh, of this cancer. Um, there's, there's, we now can identify lesions which are one centimeter or two centimeters. Perhaps we can start identifying lesions which are even smaller. We have to be able to risk stratify patients, identify those patients who are at high risk for developing the cancer or low risk. Uh, that may change uh, surveillance strategies. Um, we have to, uh, I think, get smarter about the clinical trials and realize that there may be 15 or 20 different subsets of this cancer from a genetic perspective and use biomarkers uh, such as genetic information or uh, expression profiles by immunohistochemistry to direct therapies. So for example, um, there's an uh, interesting study ongoing in the field which says that a subset of patients uh, um, have overexpression of a receptor for hepatocyte growth factor and they may respond to inhibitors of that receptor. And so this study just takes patients with high levels of expression of that receptor and then looks at uh, the potential efficacy of that receptor inhibitor in these patients. So we're getting to, uh, we're moving from targeted therapy to targeted therapy determined by biomarkers. Um, the whole field of cancer is, um, fraught by the genetic heterogeneity of cancers. Everybody uh, almost seems to have their own private cancer at some level. And it probably may not be possible to target all the driver mutations that occur in a cancer. So many cancers have 60 to 80 mutations. Uh, many of these are driver mutations. So if you block one pathway, another pathway takes over. Uh, and perhaps better strategies for therapy will be using the immune system, tricking the immune system to fight the cancer. And there's a lot of interest now in, in so-called checkpoint inhibitor drugs, uh, such as those which target uh, PD-1 um, molecules uh, to relieve the breaks on the immune system that cancer creates to allow the immune system more effective uh, in eliminating the cancer. I think that we also will have a lot to learn in the future about how, how uh, effective are the antiviral drugs in decreasing cancer. So the major causes of cancer are hepatitis B and C. We now have more effective therapies for hepatitis B and C. Uh, will those therapies um, substantially reduce or eliminate the risk of liver cell cancer in patients who otherwise have cirrhosis and are at high risk? So. Uh, a great deal to be learned, um, uh, still a lot of progress uh, needs to be uh, uh, made uh, to achieve the goals of, um, of prolonging the life of people with cirrhosis, uh, uh, reducing the risk of cancer, um, finding early tumors and, and um, treating them uh, before they become clinical problems. And even patients with advanced disease, we hope to be able to make progress in terms of uh, treatment uh, that will prolong life. My concluding remarks is that, is that this has really been a tremendous field uh, uh, with, with a very steep trajectory. When you, when you realize that 20 years ago, 
um, we thought of liver cell cancer only as a, a very advanced disease with a very short um, a lifespan. Um, in fact, in some textbooks, it was stated that people only live six weeks. We now know that we can cure people uh, with transplant, resection, ablation, um, and uh, we're beginning to learn how to prevent recurrences uh, and, 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 and use this immune system to go forward. I think that the trajectory will continue to be very steep. And um, the, the field of hepatobiliary oncology really uh, has become a legitimate uh, subdiscipline uh, within the broad context of, of uh, hepatologic care. It, it, it also epitomizes uh, team approaches to patient care. So uh, we will have to work with genetic people who understand genes, surgeons, interventional radiologists, hepatologists, uh, and other disciplines uh, to impact. But the convergence will be on identifying on uh, in hepatology because uh, there is a hepatologist who knows that who's at risk, who's taking care of the patient with liver disease. And so this will become, I think, a very burgeoning field um, and a critical subdiscipline um, in hepatology and will illustrate the value of team science.